أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد So this is our second session in our discussion on Surah Nuh and uh, in our first session we completed uh, uh, the second verse of the Surah so we continue with the uh, third verse and uh, the fourth verse and we had said the last time that we will be looking at these verses in sets so really the first set was verse 1 to 4 so I will try and look at 3 and 4 um, together before we come to the next set so verse number 3 Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاتَّقُوهُ وَاعْطِعُونَ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ مِنْ ذُنُوبِكُمْ وَيُؤَخِّرُكُمْ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى إِنَّ أَجَلَ اللَّهِ إِذَا جَاءَ لَا يُؤَخَّرْ لَوْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ And I will translate this from the translation that I'm using here of Quli uh, Qara'i. Um, so essentially after Prophet Nuh says to his people that I am a manifest warner to you, he now tells them what it is that he has come to, to, to warn them about. What is the message? The message is, Worship Allah and be wary of Him and obey me. And if you do that, then in exchange what He promises them is that He, Allah, may forgive you some of your sins and respite you until a specified time. Indeed, when Allah's appointed time comes, it cannot be deferred, should you know. Now, the first, the, the verse number three, worship, there are three things that He asks of them. Worship Allah, be wary of Him, and obey Him. We notice that He doesn't say worship Allah only or worship Allah alone, which tells us that perhaps these were not individuals who worshipped idols along with Allah, but they worshipped their gods exclusively besides Allah. Right? And uh, there are several verses of Quran of the Quran where Nuh salam is saying the same thing to the people but different parts of these three commandments it is only in this verse that he brings all these three things together for example and I won't uh, read these references right now in the interest of time but in surah 11 verse 26 um, tell me if uh, you can't see these references here. Uh, in 1126, Nuh says to the people, worship none but Allah. So he only asks them the first part. In Surah 26, verse 108, he tells them, be wary of Allah and obey me. The other two parts. But he doesn't tell them, worship Allah. Okay. And in uh, chapter 23, verse 23, we find again Nuh telling them to worship Allah and be wary of God, but now he doesn't tell them, obey me. Okay, so he basically, as you look at these different verses and you compare them to this verse, you will see this has one of it, this has two, this has the other two, but it's only this verse that brings these three um, together. And from this, you can then obviously try and understand different reasons as to why this breakup happens. One reason could be that he preached different things to them at different times. It's not necessarily that every time he preached to them, he mentioned all these three things. There were times where he may have just been emphasizing the worship of God. There are times when he may be worship, uh, emphasizing obedience to him as God's messenger and so on. But one could also look at this differently and say that perhaps these three things are really just one. The essential primary, the fundamental message is Tawheed, worship Allah. Okay? And then everything else comes out as a result of that because obviously if you don't believe in Allah then the issue of being wary of Him will not arise or the issue of obeying Him will not arise. If you obey Him, you obey Him because He's God's apostle, He's God's messenger. Okay? And we shall look at this uh, again uh, uh, in a minute. But let's just look at these uh, parts in a, a little more closely. So worship Allah, we understand that, basically. Uh, um, ibadah, do ibadah of Allah. 
Wattakuhu. Now Wattakuhu, be wary of him, shares the same root as the word taqwa. You hear taqwa all the time. Right? Taqwa. So Wattakuhu is basically have taqwa. And uh, um, for those who are uh, familiar with Arabic, they know that the word Qu in Arabic is to protect yourself or shield yourself from something. As for example, uh, where Allah says, Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum naran, protect yourselves and your family from the fire of hell. Okay, so you can see this idea of taqwa being a shield that protects you from the fire, and this is chapter 66, verse 6, where you will see actually what taqwa really means. So, and this is why you will find that if you look at older translations of the Quran, they translate taqwa as fear of God. Essentially, it's not to be afraid of God. God is not to be feared, He is to be loved. But what you need to be afraid of is coming before him on the day of judgment while you have failed in the duty that he charged you with. Okay, so the fear is of one's sins, not so much the fear of Allah. And so taqwa is generally understood as meaning to keep away from sins or to be... And that's why here it's translated as being wary of God. Being wary of God means being conscious of God. Some people instead of translating taqwa as God wariness, they translate it as God consciousness. One who is a muttaqi is someone who is constantly conscious of God. And that state of being constantly aware of God's presence, of Allah's presence, is what keeps one away from sins. It is not a rationalization process or you know, having a ta'weez with you or something that will keep you away from sins. It is being conscious of God, wary of God at all times. Okay? And so it is important to understand this deeper meaning of taqwa to understand what it is that Nuh is asking them. When he tells them, worship Allah, and then he tells them, wattaquhu, meaning be conscious of God in your lives so that you keep away from, uh, uh, from wrongdoing. So taqwa would be keep away from sins. Taqwa would also include performing those righteous obligatory deeds whose forsaking would be a sin. So doing your wajibat is also part of uh, um, taqwa. Wa'ati'oon. Wa'ati'oon is an obey me. Okay? And obey me is an invitation to say accept the message of God's messenger and take your religious understanding from him. In other words, do not use your own imagination to understand what is it that God expects from me. Allah knows that your mind is not sufficient to give you that information. That is why he sends messengers to you. So wa'ati'oon is not to gain power and fame for no. It is an essential part of your guidance that you take your religious understanding from the messenger of God. And that you worship Allah the way this messenger worships and you emulate him in all your practices. And so that would apply um, in all generations including ours that we obey the Prophet because um, in reality, obey me is nothing but obey Allah, isn't it? Um, and you can see that in chapter 10, chapter 7, verse 62, Nuh alayhi salam is very explicit about this. He tells them that they should take their guidance from him. Why? because he has the ability to communicate God's message to them. Okay? And that is why when people say the Prophet is like us, because the Quran says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ But the verse continues, it doesn't say, أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ I am a man like you, I am mortal like you, but I receive revelation. I have the ability to communicate with your Creator. And therefore, I can tell you exactly what he expects from you. Okay? And then, of course, there are many other ayats that prove this idea of obey me. For example, Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 80. Man ata'a rasul faqad ata'a Allah. Whoever obeys the messenger certainly obeys Allah. It is one and the same thing. 
So when Nuh says, obey me, it is obey Allah. And in fact, Allah in, in, in Surah An-Nisa, again, chapter 4, verse 64, on this issue of obedience to the messenger, he says, and we did not send any messenger, but to be obeyed by Allah's permission. Okay. We did not send any messenger except that he should be obeyed. And that is why they had the ability to take obedience from people. If you take, for example, just the life of our Prophet ﷺ, if you look at his background, right? He is born an orphan. He is raised with very humble beginnings. He is raised with the Bedouins in the desert. He has to take obedience from the powerful tribes of Quraysh. Right? It is impossible for any ordinary human being to stand up and claim what he claimed and still be able to succeed in the manner that he succeeded in the period he did. But it is by Allah's permission that a prophet or a messenger is obeyed. People's hearts incline towards uh, one who is a true messenger. So this, this, this um, uh, uh, commandment from Nuh alayhi salam uh, wa be wary of Allah and obey me. This is not just asked by Nuh. We see that in the later uh, prophets and messengers who come, they all ask these two things. Be conscious of God and obey me. For example, Isa alayhi salam. Okay? So Isa alayhi salam in uh, chapter 3 verse 50 as well as in uh, chapter 43 verse 63. He tells people exactly the same thing as Nuh. Be wary of God and obey me. And then um, in the interest of time, I won't give detailed references, but if you look at Surah 26, okay, if you look at Surah 26 and just skim through it, you will see that Nabi Hud alayhi salam says to people, be wary of Allah and obey me. Nabi Saleh alayhi salam says to people, be wary of Allah and obey me. Nabi Lut, Nabi Shu'aib, they all ask the same thing. Be wary of Allah, obey me. Be wary of Allah, obey me. So we understand this as being very, very fundamental um, to people's guidance. And what is interesting is that when you look at this Surah 26, all these prophets, Nuh, Hud, Saleh, Lut, Shu'aib, all of them who said, be wary of Allah and obey me, their communities disobeyed and they were destroyed by Allah. Okay. Some of the ulama have, and the mufassirun have actually uh, given this verse a lot of thought and said that if you look at it from one perspective, worship Allah, be wary of Allah and obey me, these are actually the three fundamental parts of, of usul al-deen, of our aqaid. They cover Tawheed, Ma'ad, and Nubuwa. Okay? So essentially, our belief consists of many, many, many things. The most primary thing is only Tawheed. From Tawheed, when you talk of God's justice and wisdom, the necessity for a final day of accounting becomes important. That is why repeatedly in different parts of the Quran, Allah says, do you think we created you in vain? Do you think we created things without a purpose? And he praises the believers who when they look at the creation of the heavens and the earth, they say, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. Our Lord, you did not create this in vain. So creation itself is purposeless if you don't have the day of judgment. And that is why you will see that Quran again and again, wherever it mentions one who believes in Allah, it mentions the last day. Man amana billahi wal yawmil akhir. Man amana billahi wal yawmil akhir. A lot of such references. Okay, so ma'ad sort of is a branch that comes out of tawheed. Ma'ad is in qiyamah. Okay. And then nubuwa again is part of Allah's justice and his lutf that if he expects you to behave and act in a certain manner then his justice and grace and mercy demands that he provides guidance for you. Just as he provides for your physical needs, he must provide for your spiritual needs. So nubuwa is also a, a, a subject and a part of usul al-deen that comes out from tawheed. And then from that, because the majority of the Muslims um, they share in most opinions the same uh, aqaid, but in certain things there is strong differences. Over time, the Shia have introduced other fundamental parts to usul al-deen, 
so as to uh, make it clear that our understanding of Aqaid comes from the Ahlul Bayt and we are very different in our understanding of Tawheed. So when you talk of the attributes of Allah, one of the things in Usul al-Din we teach is Adala, isn't it? Al-Adl, God's justice. Why Al-Adl? Allah has so many beautiful names and his being Adil is just one of those that we list as 99 names. And even those 99 names are not just 99. In Dua Joshan al-Kabir we have a thousand names. But out of all these names, the reason we put Al-Adala in our Usul al-Din is because the rest of the Muslims have a very different understanding of Adala. So to emphasize our stand on this matter, we bring in Adala. And the same for Imama. Imama in itself is a fundamental part of Islam and in a sense a logical continuation and extension to, to Nubuwa. Because a Nabi is one who brings news. Nabi comes from the word Naba. Rasul is one who brings a message. It comes from Risala. But Imam is one who leads. So when people ask, why do we still need an Imam today but we don't need a Nabi? Why doesn't God send more messengers? Because the news has been brought. The message has been brought. Unless there was more to bring in terms of message or news, then you would need a Nabi. But guidance has not stopped. You will still need a leader. So Imama always continues. In other words, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he was a Nabi, he was a Rasul, but he was also an Imam. Just as Ibrahim is told in the Quran, inni ja'iluka nasi Imama. Okay? So I digress here, but essentially Tawheed is seen as the most fundamental part of Usul din If you stretch it out, you see Tawheed, Nubuwa and Ma'ad. If you stretch it out further, you see Tawheed, Adala, Nubuwa, Imama and Ma'ad. And you can stretch it further and include other things as well. Okay. Uh, so what the ulama say here is that when Nu says to them, worship Allah, he is talking of Tawheed. When he says, be wary of Allah, he is talking of Ma'ad, of the Day of Judgment. Why? Because it is only a person who believes in the final day of accounting who will be concerned about not committing sins, about being wary of God. Okay? And then Nubuwa is obviously Obey Me. Obey Me is part of Nubuwa. Or you could put this differently. You could say, well, essentially in our faith there are three parts to it. One is uh, in Islam, there are three parts to it. One is faith, Iman. So worship Allah is part of your Iman, that you acknowledge Him as your God, that you worship none besides Him. And then be wary of God, you're talking of spiritual purity and practice, so that's your Amal. And then obey me is part of this divine leadership or what you might call Al-Wilaya. Okay? So there are many different uh, ways in which we can uh, dissect this verse. In the interest of time, we move on now to the fourth verse. So, Nuh salam has told the people, do this, do this, do this, and if you do this, what Allah will do for you is, one, He will forgive you some of your sins, يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ مِنْ ذُنُوبِكُمْ and He will give you time until a specified time. وَيُؤَخِرُكُمْ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى when the appointed time of Allah comes, it cannot be deferred, should you know. Now, here there is a very lengthy discussion on what Ajalun Musamma is. And I will try to be as quick as possible. And of course, as I said tonight, also we don't have time for questions because we have a program after this. But certainly write your questions and then the week after next we can start taking questions. But Essentially, you notice that first Nuh is saying to them that Allah will give you more time. But then he tells them, when the time of Allah comes, it cannot be deferred. So that immediately tells us he's talking of two different times here. Okay. Now, this has been discussed by ulama and mufassirun at great length. And there is one flaw in their argument. What they have said is this, that uh, everyone has a fixed time for dying, for their end, and everything really. If you read the Quran carefully, and if you do a search on the word Ajalun Musamma, okay, um, 
you will find that Allah even mentions the sun and the moon have an ajalun musamma. And in one ayah, He mentions everything in the heavens and the earth have an ajalun musamma. Okay? Meaning a specified time and a pointed time. So, at face value, what the Mufassirun said was this that everyone has a fixed time. And there are a hadith that tell us that based on your actions, Allah may extend or reduce your time. And so they have suggested that what Nuh is saying to the people is that if you obey me, if you worship Allah, if you be wary of him, then instead of dying sooner, Allah will extend your time so that you live to the specified time that he set for you, the ajalun musamma. Okay? And as we shall see, that actually is a flawed understanding. It's not a correct understanding. Okay? There are a hadith that say, for example, that if you do this, your life increases, this your life decreases. In particular, there are two things that are known to extend a person's life. One is giving charity, which is sadaqah. And the other is maintaining relations with family, what is called silatul raham. Okay? Whether it is calling them, saying salam to them, sending an email to them, helping them out when they are in need, keeping in touch with them, making sure if they have financial problems, you help them out of that. If they are ill, you visit them, that you are there for them, that you don't break relations with family. Particularly with blood relations is what we mean by silatul raham. Okay? And the opposite is also true that one who cuts relations with family, it is a known fact that his life is significantly reduced. This is in Shia and Sunni um, narrations, very, very widely known. What about the ibadah? In the ibadah, the time you spend in ibadah. Right. Is that considered as, uh, my understanding is that, as much time you spend in ibadah, yeah. Right. There are narrations like that, that the time you spend in ibadah is not counted out of your assigned time and so you get a certain bonus out of that. But um, more so specifically, for example, we have a hadith from Imam Jafar Sadiq in which he says, Allahumma he says to, an, to one of his uh, companions, O oh, so and so, there are numerous times in which you are supposed to have died but you have continued to live and Allah has kept extending your life because of how good you are to your family. Okay? So the one thing, there are many things like I said you will find in hadith, but the one thing that's very emphasized is silatul raham and the opposite qata'ul raham is known. In one hadith we are told sometimes a person has three days left to die, but because of one act of silatul raham, Allah extends his life by 30 years. And the Imam goes on to say that sometimes a person has 30 years of his life left, but because of one breaking of relations with family, Allah reduces it to three days. Okay, so the change is significant in that sense. Now, the problem we have with this interpretation here, that Nuh is saying to the people, that if you are good, Allah will extend your time to the ajalun musamma, is that... Uh, there are several ayats of Qur'an where Allah says about different communities who sinned and who said to their prophets and messengers, we challenge you to bring Allah's punishment. We are ready for Allah's wrath. Bring it. Right? In fact, the people of Nuh as well um, do that. In uh, chapter 11, verse 32, they challenge Nuh. They say, no, you have discussed and debated long enough. Now bring the punishment of God. Where is this punishment you're promising us? Right? Now, I have numerous, numerous references here. But just to give you an example, um, I'll write this at the top here. Chapter 29, which is Surah Al-Ankabut, verse 53. And I'll just read the translation for you. Allah is talking about these people that are basically asking for his wrath and punishment. He says, yet, were it not for a specified time, were it not for their ajalun musamma, the punishment would surely have overtaken them. Okay? If it had not been for their ajalun musamma, their punishment would have overtaken them. Now, because this might be of interest to you, I'll give you some other references very, very quickly here on the side. 1661, 
Okay, I think this is enough for evidence. If you look at all these verses, what you will see is that in all these cases, Allah is almost holding back and saying, had it not been for their ajal and musamma, I would have destroyed them right away. So the question here is, if a community is not destroyed until their ajal and musamma, then what is Nuh offering them? Nuh is saying to them, if you worship God and you obey him, he will extend your life to ajal and musamma. If they knew the Quran, obviously the Quran hadn't been revealed at that time, they would have said, oh no, what are you talking about? Allah says he's not going to kill us until our Rajul and Musama. So what kind of an offer is this? Right? You've got to see the, 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 the issue here. So there are, and this was something, trust me, I, I went through a tafsir software that has hundreds of tafsir, Shia, Sunni, different centuries from the earliest time to the latest and kept trying to find the answer to this puzzle and no one had this answer except Imam Jafar al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad the answer to this is that the ajalun musamma as well is a variable but the first thing you need to understand is separate how this works for individuals and how this works for a community okay for an individual, and there are many ahadith as well, and again, in the interest of time, I can't give you all the hadith here, but what I will try and do is share some of these notes with you at the end, right at the end when we complete our uh, uh, tafsir of Surah Nuh. Essentially, in one hadith, Imam al-Sadiq says that there is an ajalun musamma which is reviewed on the night of Qadr, which can change and we pray for these things, you will notice on the 15th night of Sha'ban, on the uh, Laylatul Qadr, we pray for, uh, uh, we say that uh, to Allah, um, the words escape me about, um, um, write for me Hajj every year, وَقَتْلًا فِي سَبِيلِكَ فَوَفِّقْ لَنَا وَصَالِحَ مِنَ الدُّعَاءِ And before that it is, um, it escapes me, it escapes me. In the interest of time, again, I will not try and recall that. But if you look at that dua, it says, فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ مِنَ الْقَضَاءِ الَّتِي حَتَمْتَهَا Okay, so, وَحَكَمْتَهَا And then there is one which says, لَا يُتُبَدِّلُونَ وَلَا تُغَيِّرُ Which does not change and which does not alter. And the Imam explains it in that relationship and says, there is an ajalun musamma and there is an ajalun mahtum. Mahtum is the one that is absolutely fixed and ordained. And obviously there's a discussion here to say that if a person does so much good that he deserves more than the ajalun mahtum, then what happens? Okay, and there's answers to that as well. But for an individual, your life may prolong or shorten depending on your individual actions. And that is an ajalun musamma that might be reviewed and might change. But there is an ajalun mahtum which does not change. For a community, the ajalun musamma is set, it does not shorten. Why? Because as a community, obviously the life expectancy is greater. As an individual, even if my life was to extend, I might live to 60 or 80 or 90 or 100 or 120, but not beyond that. But as a community, because different generations are growing as the older generation is passing away, the community itself may end up living for several centuries as well. So a community has an ajalun musamma. It will not shorten. But if they were to repent and to do good and to become a means through which Allah's mercy shines on the earth, then Allah might extend the ajalun musamma. In other words, what Nuh is promising them is that your ajalun musamma has been set. It will not shorten. But if you worship Allah and be wary of Him and obey me, then it might extend because your ajalun musamma is not necessarily your ajalun mahtum. Okay. Now, one might say that if they refuse to repent, they still have the advantage of enjoying life until the ajalun musamma that does not change. 
Here Allah says that those whom we allow and we give respite to, do not think that by giving them a longer life it is good for them. It is actually bad for them because the longer they live, the more sins they accumulate, which is going to become a greater burden for them. And this you will find in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 178, where Allah very clearly says that do not think that the time we give them extra is good for them. It is actually bad for them. Okay. Now, let me see if there is something else here. Uh, yes, there are, again, if you look at the Quran, there are other references to see that other prophets as well promised their people for Ajal and Musamma. This understanding is very important because the Mufassirun, when they were not able to understand this, they started thinking of different reasons, and some of the reasons didn't make any sense at all. For example, one Mufassir by the name of Shawkani, he says what Nuh was saying to them was that if you worship Allah and be wary of Him and obey me, then Allah promises you that you will die a natural death, and not by drowning or by fire or in battle. Which doesn't make sense because you can't promise that to the whole community, that all of you are going to die a natural death. None of you is going to drown or none of you is going to die in an accident. Okay. The other proof that uh, Noah is talking to them as a community, that your community's life will extend and not as individuals, is that when you read the Surah Noah further down, you will see that in verse 11 and verse 12, he is promising them other things. He is saying to them that if you seek forgiveness from God, he will send down abundant rains for you. In other words, he will make your land fertile for you. And he will bless you with gardens and streams, right? Now, this sort of a promise cannot be at an individual level. It's not going to be that if you are good, you're going to get rain, but the rest of the community is not going to get rain, right? It's not going to work like that. So, just generally looking at how he is promising them, we get this idea that he is promising them as a community. The opposite is also true, that when the flood took place, Noah was told to take a pair of every animal. That means the other animals perished in the flood. Now one might argue they were innocent. And later on in this surah, we're going to come to a very interesting discussion on whether, were there any children who died in the flood or not? Okay? And there's lots of opinions about that. And why would they have died in the flood? But at this point, what we want to say about the idea of a community, a nation, being corrupt versus being righteous, is that if a community, the majority are transgressors, uh, the majority disobey Allah, then the faithful and the righteous will suffer the consequences because they are part of that community. Okay? It is not possible for them to be treated differently. Um, Ayatollah Shahid Baqir al-Sadr has a very interesting book called, uh, um, I think, Trends, in, uh, uh, Trends of History in Quran. And if you search for this on the internet, you will find it on al-islam.org as well. Trends, in, Trends of History in Quran. And in that he talks about this in a very interesting example. First of all, he says, a nation, like an individual, lives, produces, and dies. Its life may be longer because it is made up of many individuals. But the verses of the Quran that talk about individuals must be delineate, uh, delineated from those that apply to communities. Then he gives examples. Then he gives a very nice example. He says, when the children of Banu Israel were punished and told they must wander through the desert for 40 years, Musa alayhi salam, who was pure and he was a Rasul, he had to wander in the desert with them for 40 years as well. So from one perspective it wasn't fair because they were being punished that you will wander for 40 years. He's a prophet, he's pure, he's innocent, but he must wander with them because he is part of that community. Okay. In the next world, of course, the good and the bad are clearly separated. In Surah Yasin, for example, chapter 36, verse 59, there comes a point after the accounting when the good are rushing to paradise and the evil are trying to catch up with them and saying, wait, give us a bit of your light so that we may take some of your nur. This is all in the Quran. At one point they are told in Surah Yasin, وَمْتَازُ الْيَوْمَ أَيُّهَا الْمُجْرِمُونَ وَمْتَازُ imtiaz is to, to distinguish yourselves. So separate yourselves, become distinct, 
And that surah, that verse is the talk about the guilty running after the pious and trying to steal some of their nur. Allah says we will set a barrier between them. So that on one side will be the mercy of God, on the other side will be the punishment, the wrath of Allah. Okay, So there things are separated, but here things are mixed up. And, and we must coexist and understand that if we live in a society that is uh, um, disobedient to Allah, then we suffer the consequences. And we shall see later on when we talk about the abundant rains and so on, that when people turn away from Allah's worship and obedience, then drought is a consequence of it. Natural disasters are a consequence of it. Earthquakes are a consequence of that. We shall see that. Now, if you live in that society and there is a drought, you will suffer the drought as well. Okay. Um, Sayyid Fadlallah in his tafsir, Min Wahy al-Quran, has another take on this completely, and I'll just mention it in passing. He says, Ajalun Musamma could be the day of judgment. In other words, Nuh could be telling them that instead of taking you to task in this world, Allah will defer your accounting until the day of judgment, and all your deeds or misdeeds will be dealt with in the hereafter. So you will have extra time to repent and to make up for the wrong you may have done. And Allah Ma'atabatabai as well uh, has said that this is also possible. Okay? And based on that, then you would interpret the rest of the verse where Nuh says, and the time of Allah, when it comes, it cannot be deferred, should you know. You could assume that to be the Ajalum Mahtum, which means he's telling them that if you worship Allah, Allah will extend your Ajalun Musamma. But Ida Ja'a Ajaluhu, meaning when the Ajalun Mahtum comes, that cannot be deferred. Or you could assume he's talking about the Day of Judgment and saying when that comes, it cannot be deferred. In which case then all the other verses that talk about the sun and the moon having an Ajalun Musamma and so on, you would also interpret that as meaning um, the, the hour of doom or the Day of Judgment. Now, um, I have five minutes more, okay? So let me just, um, because I have taken a lot of time with this verse, um, I will just come into a bit of the next verse and say, there is another entire discussion on this verse, but I'm afraid if I spend so much time on individual parts of every verse, we will never complete Surah Nuh. Okay, <clears throat> I will tell you what that discussion is, and if there is enough interest, we can go into that. We don't have to finish the whole surah. If we don't finish, we don't finish it, right? That other discussion is that when Nuh says to them, he will forgive you your sins, he tells them, يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ مِنْ ذُنُوبِكُمْ He doesn't tell them he will forgive you your sins. He says he will forgive you min. Now min, some have translated as some of your sins. And some have translated it as from, or a part of, okay? So those who have said some have then gone to details of saying what he meant was he will only forgive your past sins, but it's not a guarantee of the future. And some have said this doesn't make any sense because that is understood that the future is not forgiven. And some have said that if he forgave them at this point, then at this point everything is fresh, so everything they've committed is past anyway, okay? So what does yaghfir lakum min dhunubikum? But that word min alone can take us easily 15 minutes to discuss. Okay? And this is just to give you an idea of how much pain um, the Mufassirun and ulama have taken to explore every word in the Quran and not assume or take it in passing to say, why did Allah say min dhunubikum and not just dhunubikum? Okay? Um, just as a uh, segue to the next four verses, and I will end, we're going to look at now verses 5 to 9. And so if you have some time over the next two weeks, try and do some research of your own. Essentially, the first part that we've looked, verse 1 to 4, was a summary of Nuh's preaching to his people. Now verses 5 to 9 is a summary of his lamenting to Allah. And then verses 10 to 20 will be detailed of his preaching. And then 21 to the end will be detailed of his lamenting. So there is a cycle here. Okay? So in a summary of his lamenting, he says, My Lord, indeed I have summoned my people night and day. But my summons only increase their evasion. 
Indeed, whenever I have summoned them, so that you might forgive them, they put their fingers into their ears and draw their cloaks over their heads. And they were persistent in their unfaith and disdainful in their arrogance. Again, I summoned them aloud and again appealed to them publicly and confided with them privately. Okay? So some of the things you could try and look at, and I'm just giving you sort of hints at what areas you could try and develop on your own. And then when we meet and discuss, try and see what you have researched, how closely it might match with what I have been able to find is one is the insistence of Nu and the different ways in which he describes night and day, loudly and personally and privately and why is he talking about, what does he mean by all this? Uh, and the other is all the graphic description he gives us that every time I preach to them they evade me and they put their fingers in their ears and they cover themselves. Is it just because they were an early generation so they were very childish? Or is it a natural human tendency when they are averse to the truth, they behave like that? If that is the case, how would you relate it to our society today? In what way do we put our fingers in our ears and cover ourselves when we don't want to hear the truth? Okay. So give this some thought, inshallah, and we shall continue um, not next week, but the week after that, bi'idhnihi ta'ala, inshallah. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد